Chapter Six of Superwomen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Superwomen by Albert Payson Teryun. Chapter Six. Adrienne Lecouvreur, the actress Heart Queen. She was an ex laundress and the daughter of a hatter he was an ideal dime novel hero and the son of a king she was all spirit he was all body and their love story is perhaps the strangest of its sort in the sad annals of hearts their great-great-granddaughter by the way was george sand a four generation throwback of the nameless superwoman trait having thus rhapsodied with the hope of catching the reader's attention one may ring up the curtain on a romance whose compelling interest cannot be spoiled by the most bungling writing she was adrienne le Couvreur, and like the bulk of history's superwomen she sprang from the masses her childhood was spent in beating against the bars behind which her eagle spirit was locked at fourteen she joined a road company and within a few years she was acclaimed as the greatest actress the world had thus far known as a comedienne she was a failure it was in tragedy that she soared to untouched heights and her life from cradle to unmarked grave was one long sustained tragedy of love or rather of loves for she had divers harsh experiences before the last great love flashed upon her it was at lille while she was still in her apprenticeship as an actress that adrienne met a young baron a captain in the local garrison he loved her and he was her first love it was not the custom of the early eighteenth century for a french noble to propose marriage to a former laundress who was playing utility parts in a third-rate road show probably there was no precedent for it and such a proposal would have been a waste of windy words at best for neither the king nor the man's parents would have allowed it to lead to marriage yet or perhaps because of it the baron asked adrienne le couvreur to be his wife she was in the seventh paradise of first love it was all turning out the way it did in plays and plays were thus far adrienne's chief guidebook of life so the prettily staged engagement began with roseate light effects before adrienne had time for disillusionment the baron died in the first grief she was at an age when every tragedy is absolutely permanent and irrevocable the luckless girl tried to kill herself her kindly fellow actors took turns in watching her and in abstracting unobtrusively any lethal weapons that might chance to be within her reach and at last youth came to the rescue permanent heartbreak being too mighty a feat for sixteen adrienne fell to referring to the baron's death as her life tragedy not yet realizing that the affair was but an insignificant curtain raiser by and by another nobleman crossed her horizon he was philippe le ray and for the moment he fascinated adrienne once more there was a hope or she thought there was of a marriage into the aristocracy then just as everything seemed to be along smoothly she threw away her possible chances with both hands into the road company came a new recruit clavel by name you will not find him in the shining records of the french stage nor under the seas in any encyclopedia his name has been picked in history's museum solely from the fact that he jilted adrienne le couvreur philippe le ray was promptly shelved for the new love and with him adrienne sacrificed all her supposed chances of wealth rank and ease 
for the sake of a penniless actor and for love she became engaged to clavel they planned to marry as soon as their joint earnings would permit and to tour france as co-stars or if the public preferred with clavel as star and with adrienne as an adoringly humble member of the cast early in the affair clavel found a better paying position in another company adrienne urged him to accept it for the temporary parting promised to bring nearer the day of their marriage and clavel to please her took the offer so again adrienne found herself alone but it was a loneliness that vibrated with hope it was at this time that she chose for herself a motto which thereafter emblazoned her letters and lingerie it was que faire mon sans ami what is living without loving she was soon to learn the grim answer to the challenge query she so gaily hurled at fate clavel's letters grew few they waned in warmth odd rumors with which the theatre world has ever been rife began to reach adrienne and at last she wrote her absent lover a missive that has been numbered by cognoscenti among the great love letters of the ages here it is in part a halting translation i scarce know what to believe from your neglect but be certain always that i love you for yourself a hundred times more dearly than on my own account oh love me dear as i shall forever love you that is all i ask from life but don't promise to unless you can keep your word your welfare is far more precious to me than my own so always follow the course that seems most pleasant to you if ever i lose you and you are still happy i shall have the joy of knowing i have not been a bar to your happiness the worthy clavel took adrienne at her word he proceeded to follow the course that seemed most pleasant to him by breaking the engagement and marrying a lesser woman who had a dot of several thousand francs he explained his action by saying that he must look out for his own future and that adrienne had no prospects of success on the stage and thus the thrifty actor passes out of history thus too he lost a future chance to handle the funds of europe's richest actress and of starring as her husband peace to his puny soul adrienne le couvreur no longer clamoured to die she was older now nearly twenty and the latest blow hardened instead of crushing her by this time the girlish chrysalis had been shed and a gloriously beautiful woman had emerged already she was hailed as the actress heart queen men were straining the vocabulary of imbecility to coin phrases for her and for the first and last time in her career adrienne resolved to capitalize her charms it was the one adventurous moment in all her story and the hand that ever guided her course picked her up and set her back very hard and very promptly in the destined path of tragedy from which she had tried to stray stinging and heart dead from clavel's desertion she listened to the vows of the comte de klinglin he was rich he was a soldier of note and adrienne was no longer the world innocent child of her first engagement days she played her cards with the skill of a perfect actress from mere flirtation the count advanced to the point of worshipping her de klinglin besought her to marry him and with seeming reluctance she yielded she even pointed out a way by which they might evade royal and family law by emigrating for a time to some other country and then by judicious bribery arranging a return and a reinstatement 
de Klinglin entered eagerly into the plan then on the very eve of their proposed wedding the count deserted her and married an heiress decidedly the hand was guiding adrienne against every effort or desire of her own this latest blow to pride and to newborn ambition was the turning point in adrienne le couvreur's road it changed her from a professional beauty into an inspired actress she threw herself into her work with a tragic intensity bred of her own sorrows she turned her back on social distractions and on everything that came between her and success her acting as well as her beauty became the talk of the provinces word of her prowess drifted to paris the mecca of eighteenth-century actor folk a paris manager came to see her act and he at once engaged her in seventeen seventeen when she was twenty-three she burst unheralded upon the french metropolis in a night paris was at her feet almost at once she was made a leading woman of the comedie francaise where for thirteen years she reigned undisputed sovereign of the french stage never before had such acting been witnessed or even imagined it was a revelation up to this time french actors had mouthed their words noisily and grandiloquently reciting the alexandrine or otherwise metrical lines wherein practically all the classic plays of the period except some of moliere's were written in a sing-song chant that played sad havoc with the sense incidentally the costuming as you may see from contemporary cuts was a nightmare and when a character on the stage was not declaiming or dramatically listening he usually stood stock still in a statuesque attitude staring into blank space with the look of an automaton all this seems ridiculous to us but it had come straight down as an almost inviolable classic tradition from the ancient greek drama which had been more a series of declamations than a vital play yes adrienne le couvreur was a revelation to paris on the stage her voice was as soft and musical as it was penetrating instead of intoning a pompous monologue she spoke her lines as people in real life spoke her emotions were keenly human every syllable and every shade of voice meant something without sacrificing the poetry of the rhymed couplets she put the breath of life and of conversational meaning into them she dressed the characters she played in the way such persons might reasonably have been supposed to dress she made them a joy to the eye instead of an insult to the intelligence and when she was not speaking she was forever acting introducing a million bits of by-play to replace the old statuesque poses she had lived and she put the breath of that life into her work this seems simple enough to us in these days of stage realism but it was a wonder-breeding novelty to france adrienne revolutionized acting diction and costuming paris acclaimed her as a genius which a bused term was for once well applied men of rank clamoured for introductions to her they plotted and sighed and bribed and killed one another for her favour but for them all she had one stereotyped answer an answer that waxed historic through many firm repetitions love is a folly which i detest which in conjunction with her motto what is living without loving throws a sidelight on adrienne's ideas of life at the moment not only did she revolutionize the stage but she was the first actress to be taken up by society 
not only the foremost men in france but their wives as well threw open to her the magic doors of the faubourg saint germain old philippe the regent was misgoverning france just then and to say that his court was morally rotten would be gross flattery the unapproachable le couvreur was thus a freak as well as a delight like the good old overworked breath of mountain air in a slum this loveless genius swept through the palaces of paris and versailles a hundred nobles longed for her favor not one could boast that he had so much as kissed her lips here is her picture sketched from the mercure of seventeen nineteen without being tall she is exquisitely formed and has an air of distinction no one on earth has greater charm her eyes speak as eloquently as her lips and often they supply the place of words in brief i can compare her only to a flawless miniature her head is well poised on shapely shoulders her eyes are full of fire her mouth is pretty her nose slightly aquiline her face is wonderfully adapted to express joy tenderness pity fear sorrow and adrienne her opinion of all this adulation is summed up in one sentence from a letter she wrote i spend three-fourths of my time in doing what bores me among her maddest admirers was a wizened monkey-faced youth who even then was writing anarchistic doctrines that one day were to help shake france's worm-eaten old monarchy to its fall he was francois marie arouet but for reasons best known to himself he preferred to be known simply as voltaire a name to which he had no right whatever but by which alone history remembers him voltaire was adrienne le couvreur's adoring slave she treated him only as a dear friend but she loved to hear his vitriolic anathemas on government the aristocracy and theology he was in the midst of one of these harangues at her rooms one evening when the chevalier de rohan bearer of the proudest name in all europe sauntered in he eyed the monkey-like voltaire in amused disfavor then drawled to no one in particular who is this young man who talks so loud a young man sir retorted voltaire who is not forced to stagger along under a name far too great for him but who manages to secure respect for the name he has de rohan's tasseled cane swung aloft adrienne tactfully prevented its fall by collapsing in a stage faint but the incident did not close there next day voltaire was set upon by ruffians in rohan's pay and beaten half to death the victim did not complain there was no justice for a commoner in france at that time against a member of the haute noblesse so voltaire contented himself by going to a fencing master and practicing for a year or more in the use of the small sword at the end of that period he challenged rohan to mortal combat rohan professed to regard the challenge as a piece of insolence and through royal favor had voltaire sent by lettre de cachet to the bastille there was no chance for redress and on his release voltaire prudently let the feud drop at the perihelion of adrienne's diana-like sway over french hearts a new social lion arrived in paris he was maurice comte de saxe born of a morganatic union between a german countess and augustus the strong king of poland augustus by the way was the parent of no less than one hundred and sixty-three children an interesting record 
even in those days of large families and one that should have gone far toward earning for him the title of father of his country sax came to paris crowned with laurels one as a dashing military leader as a fearless duelist and as an irresistible heartbreaker he had won by sheer bravery and strategic skill the rank of marshal he was of the man-on-horseback type over whom crowds go wild the new hero was a giant in stature strikingly handsome and so strong that in one hand he could crush a horseshoe into a shapeless lump he was a paladin ajax don juan tamerlane mark antony baldur all rolled into one he was a glorious animal high of spirits and of hopes devoid of fear and of the finer feelings a greek god or whatever you will and about him hung the glamour of countless conquests on the battlefield and in love that such a man should have turned paris's head was inevitable equally natural was it that paris women should make fools of themselves over him but why so gross and unintellectual a wooer should have made the very slightest impression on a character like adrienne le couvreur's must be relegated to the mystery of choice collection of riddles yet at sight she who for years had scoffed at passion and who had so often declared her heart was dead felt that she had met the love of her life she gave her revivified heart and her whole soul into maurice de saxe's keeping forever and ever there were no reservations hers was a love that could die only with her life the former affairs were to her as half-forgotten dreams sax and sax alone held her love held it as no other man had been able to adrienne at first dazzled sax as a tropic butterfly might dazzle a champion bulldog the dazzle soon wore off but it left behind a comfortable feeling of affection of admiration of gratified vanity that he alone had been chosen by her out of all the world of suitors with the deft hands of a sculptor adrien le couvreur moulded sax's rough nature she refined him taught him to replace the ways of the camp by those of civilization made him less of a beast and more of a man showed him how to think all of which added to the man's popularity with other women which was the sole reward adrienne reaped for her educative efforts sax was notoriously untrue to her in his rages he berated her as a cabby might have scolded his drunken wife he used his power over her to raise himself in others esteem in short he was wholly selfish throughout and he gruffly consented to accept adrienne's worship as his just due but adrienne's love merely waxed stronger and brighter under such abominable treatment she lived for sax alone the duchy of courland lost its duke his place was to be filled by election and with the dukedom went the hand of a russian princess whose face sax unchivalrously compared to a westphalia ham sax's ambition awoke in his veins ran royal blood he wanted to be a duke and the husband of a princess he entered as candidate in the contest lack of money for judicious bribes to the free and incorruptible electors stood in his way he went as ever in trouble to adrienne and as ever she rose to the occasion she knew that as duke of courland he could not see her again or be within several hundred miles of her 
she knew too that by helping him with the dukedom she was helping to give him to another woman a lesser love than hers would have rebelled at either possibility but adrienne's love for saxe was that which not only casts out fear but casts out self along with it she sold every piece of jewellery and every costly dress and stick of furniture in her possession borrowed money left and right and mortgaged her salary at the comedie francaise the net result was fifteen thousand dollars which she gladly handed over to Saxe for the expenses of his campaign with these sinews of war Saxe hastened to courlan there he remained for a year working hard for his election making love to the ham-faced princess fighting like a norse berserker in battle after battle he was elected duke but russia refused to sanction the election at the head of a handful of fellow adventurers Saxe went on fighting performing prodigies of personal valor and strength in conflicts against overwhelming odds but at last he was hopelessly beaten in battle and still more hopelessly outpointed in the game of politics and back he came to paris a failure adrienne used every art and charm to make him forget his misfortunes and find happiness once more in her love he treated her overtures as a surly schoolboy might treat those of an over-affectionate little sweetheart he consented to be petted and comforted by the woman who adored him but he reeked in her the ill temper bred of his defeat for example he professed to believe her untrue to him he was furiously jealous or pretended to be and he accused her of the infidelity he had himself a thousand times practised poor adrienne aghast at such insane charges vainly protested her innocence and her utter love for him one of her letters to saxe during this dark hour has been preserved it begins i am worn out with grief i have wept this livelong night it is foolish of me since i have nothing wherewith to reproach myself but i cannot endure severity from you i am suspected accused by you oh how can i convince you you who alone can wound my heart in the midst of this wretched misunderstanding came a crumb of comfort to the luckless woman albeit the incident that caused it led also indirectly to her death francois de lorraine duchess de bouillon fell violently in love with saxe and did not hesitate to tell him so saxe laughed in her face and hinted that he cared too much for adrienne le couvreur just then to be interested in any one else it was not the truth for his love for adrienne had never served as an obstacle to any other of his myriad amours but it served to rebuff the duchess who did not interest him and to make adrienne very very happy when he repeated to her the conversation as a by-product it threw the duchess into a frame of mind described by congreve in his line about the gehana like fury of a woman scorned a few days after this in july seventeen twenty nine adrienne received an anonymous note asking her to be at a certain corner of the luxembourg gardens at eleven o'clock the following morning being quite without fear and not at all without curiosity she went no she was not set upon by masked assassins she found awaiting her nothing more formidable than a pale and badly scared young man in clerical garb the clerical youth introduced himself as the abbe bourret a hanger-on of the bouillon household bourret told adrian that the duchess had bribed him heavily to send her rival a box of poisoned bonbons with a note 
saying the candies were the gift of an unknown and humble admirer the abbey had seen adrienne a few nights earlier at the theatre so struck had he been by the gentleness and beauty of her face that he could not carry out his murderous commission hence the warning adrienne took the abbey and the candy too straight to the police a bonbon was fed to a street dog the animal screaming and writhing in agony died within fifteen minutes this seemed even to the eighteenth-century paris police a fairly good proof of the duchess's guilt naturally they did not arrest her grace but they put certain respectful queries to her strangely enough the duchess indignantly denied that she had tried to poison adrienne bourret cross-examined stuck determinedly to his story so through the bouillon influence he was thrown into prison and was kept there in solitary confinement in a damp and unlighted dungeon with occasional torture until he saw the error of his ways and confessed that his charge had been a lie thus was the faultless duchess de bouillon triumphantly cleared of an unjust accusation the duchess celebrated her vindication by attending the theatre one night when adrienne le couvreur was playing in fed the duchess sat in a stage box and mockingly applauded her rival adrienne paid no overt heed at first to her presence but when she came to the scene in which fed expresses to enone her contempt for a certain class of women adrienne turned her back on the wondering enone strode to the footlights and her blazing eyes seizing and gripping the duchess's declaimed directly to her Fedor's lines i know my own faults but i am not one of those brazen women who calm even in the exposure of their crimes can face the world without a blush the duchess shrank back as if she had been lashed across the face shielding her eyes with her hands she ran shuddering from the theatre scribe's play adrienne le couvreur and the opera of the same title make much of this episode so did eighteenth-century paris folk openly declared that the duchess de bouillon would not long rest impotent under so public an insult and they were right whether the poison was sent in a bouquet as contemporary writers declared or in some other form adrienne was suddenly stricken by mortal illness less than half a century had passed since the dying king charles had lived a week in spite of the best physicians in england and the science of medicine had crept forward but few hesitating steps in the past forty-five years poor stricken adrienne did not even need the best malpractice in france to help her to her grave doctors great and doctors greater the quacks of the rive gauche and the higher-priced quacks of court and faubourg all stood in turn at the dying girl's bedside and consulted gravely in latin while Saxe raged at them and cursed them for a parcel of solemn nincompoops which they were after a time they all trooped away these long-faced men of pill and potion they confessed they could find no remedy they could not so much as name the ailment at least they did not aloud for the memory of the first poison scandal and its revealer's fate was still fresh in men's minds and after the doctors came the priest a priest hastily summoned by the infidel voltaire who had been crying outside the death chamber door the priest was among the most bigoted of his kind in his eyes the victim was not the reigning beauty of paris but a sinning creature who had defied god's laws by going on the stage 
theology in those days barred actors and actresses from the blessings of the church yet bigoted as was this particular priest he was not wholly heartless the weeping little monkey-like man crouched on the stairs outside the door may have touched his heart for voltaire could be wondrous eloquent and persuasive or the red-eyed raging giant on his knees at the bedside may have appealed to his pity almost as much as did the lovely white face lying so still there among the pillows at all events the good priest consented to strain a point if adrienne would adjure her allegiance to the stage and banish all earthly thoughts he would absolve her and would grant her the right of extreme unction do you place your hope in the god of the universe he intoned slowly the great dark eyes already wide with the eternal mystery turned from the priest to the sobbing giant who knelt at the opposite side of her bed adrienne le couvreur stretched out her arms towards saxe for the last of many thousand times pointing at her weeping lover she whispered to the priest there is my universe my hope my god the good priest scuttled away in pious horror adrienne le couvreur sank back upon the pillows dead and unabsolved that night acting on a strong hint from the bouillon family who had heard that voltaire intended to demand an autopsy the police carried adrienne's body away in a cab and buried it in a bed of quicklime for nearly two long months maurice comte de saxe scarcely looked at another woman End of chapter six recording by linda johnson Chapter 7 of Superwomen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Superwomen by Albert Payson Terhune. Chapter 7 Cleopatra, the Serpent of Old Nile some thirty-five years ago in the north jersey village of pompton the township undertaker's barn burned down it was a spectacular midnight fire all the natives turned out to view it dominie jansen even hinted i remember that it was a visitation on the community for some of his neighbors sins whereat lem salisbury took the pledge for the eighth time that year well the next week when the pompton clarion appeared no mention was made of the fire the only event of intense human interest by the way since joel binswanger the official local sot six months earlier had at the village tavern swallowed a half pint flask of carbolic acid set aside for cleaning the brasses under the conviction that it was applejack joel had complained of a rough throat and an unwonted taste in his mouth for days afterward the clarion editor taken to task for printing nothing about the fire excused the omission by saying what had been the use of writing the story everybody knows about it that's all there is to the anecdote yes i've heard better myself i've even heard the same one better told it serves though as a fitting preamble to my story about cleopatra everybody knows about it who can say anything about her that you have not heard perhaps i can probably not will you be patient with me and even as tourists visit european shrines to verify their baedekers read this story to verify what you have always known Cleopatra cannot be omitted from any superwoman series, and I will make her as interesting as I know how. 
personally i believe the pomptonians would far rather have read about that barn blaze which they had seen than about the conflagration of a whole foreign metropolis at sixteen in fifty two b c cleopatra's known career as a heartbreaker began although there are rumors of more than one still earlier affair with egyptian nobles as their heroes she was the daughter of ptolemy Aulites, ptolemy the piper cordially hated ruler of egypt cleopatra and her baby brother young ptolemy nominally shared the throne for a time they were both children they ruled much as the baby drives when he holds the reins of the horse at whose head is the hostler's guiding hand all manner of adventures both native and greek were the real rulers one of these factions drove cleopatra from the throne and from her capital at alexandria leaving the triple uraeus crown with its mystic lotus adornments on the head of baby ptolemy alone the crown was the only fragment of actual kingship the child possessed the power and the graft lay in the hands of a trio of industriously grasping greek adventurers cleopatra meantime out in the cold schemed to regain her place on the double throne and even at that early age amused herself in the interim by planning the tortures she would wreak on little ptolemy when her turn should come while she was casting about for means to outwit the greeks and seeking means to buy up a mercenary army of invasion she learned that julius caesar an elderly roman of vast repute as a conqueror had come to alexandria at the head of a few legions on a mission of diplomacy cleopatra may have known little of men's strength but already she was a profound student of their weaknesses she began to ask questions about caesar brushing away as immaterial if true her scared native attendants statements that he had the body of an elephant the head of a tiger and the claws of a dragon and that he fed on prisoners served raw she pumped one or two exiled romans and gleaned an inkling of the conqueror's history with the details of caesar's gallic invasion his crushing of pompey and his bullying of semi-hostile fellow romans she did not in the least concern herself what most interested cleopatra were the following domestic revelations he had been married at least four times and three of his wives were still living kosutia the wife of his youth he had divorced by law because he had been captivated by the charms of one cornelia whom he had forthwith married and who had died before he had had time to name her successor next in order he had wed pompeia and on the barest rumor of indiscretion on her part had announced dramatically caesar's wife must be above suspicion and had divorced her to marry his present spouse calpurnia the interstices between these unions had been garnished with many a love episode adamant as he was toward men caesar was far from being an anchorite where women were concerned and he had the repute of being unswervingly loyal to the woman whom he at the time chanced to love this scurrilous information was quite enough for cleopatra she had her plans accordingly she would see caesar more to the point she would be seen by caesar but how caesar was in alexandria the stronghold of her enemies it would mean capture and subsequent death for cleopatra to be found in the city yet she planned not only to enter alexandria but to make her first appearance before caesar in a way designed to catch his attention and more than friendly interest from the very start julius caesar sat in the great audience hall of the alexandria palace whose use he had commandeered as his temporary headquarters behind him stood his guards heavy armored 
tanned of face short thick swords at hip before his dais trailed a procession of folk who hated him as starkly as they feared him they were egyptians with favors to ask and they bore gifts to endorse their pleas they were greeks who sought to outwit the barbarian victor or to trick him into the granting of concessions one by one the suppliants crawled past each crying out an appeal or a grievance nearly every one made a peace offering until the mass of gifts was stacked high on the stone floor of the audience hall presently entered two black porters strapping nubian giants who bore lightly between them a roll of rare persian carpet they halted laid down their burden on the floor at caesar's feet fell on their knees in obeisance and waited on the floor lay the roll of priceless weave no one coming forward to make the rich gift an excuse for the urging of some boon caesar grew inquisitive he leaned forward to examine the tight-folded shimmering rug more carefully as he did so the folds were suddenly flung aside and a girl leaped to her feet from among them thus had cleopatra entered alexandria thus had she penetrated to caesar's presence thus too by her craft and daring had she won the attention of the man whose daring and craft had conquered the world caesar stared in delighted interest he saw standing gracefully and wholly undraped before him a slender red-haired girl snub-nosed and of no special beauty but at a glance this man who saw everything saw too that she possessed an unnameable fascination a magnetism that was greater by far than that of any other woman he had known in all his fifty-eight years it was julius caesar's first introduction to a superwoman to the superwoman of superwomen to a woman beside whose snub-nosed plain face under its shock of red hair the memory of the roman beauties who had so often charmed his idle hours grew dim and confused cleopatra on her part saw nothing so impressive as an elephant tiger dragon monster she beheld a thin undersized man nearly sixty years old hawk-nosed inscrutable of eye on whose thin gray locks to mask his fast-growing baldness rested a chaplet of laurel leaves this was the hero whose cunning and whose war genius had caused sceptred men to grovel at his feet and had made stubborn republican rome his cringing servant but he was also the man whose weakness was an attractive woman and on this weakness cleopatra at once proceeded to play yet she speedily found that caesar's was but a surface weakness and that beneath it lay iron gladly he consented to save her from her foes and even in a measure to let her punish such of those foes as were of no use to him but as for making her the undisputed queen of egypt and setting her triumphantly and independently on the throne of her ancestors at rome's expense he had not the remotest idea of doing that nor could all her most bewildering blandishments wring such a foolish concession from him he made love to her ardent love but he did not let love interfere in any way with politics instead of carrying her to the throne through seas of her enemy's blood he carried cleopatra back to rome with him and to the scandal of the whole city installed her in a huge marble villa there and there no secret being made of caesar's infatuation for her cleopatra remained for the next few years indeed until caesar's death there too 
caesar's son caesarian was born and with the boy's birth came to cleopatra the hope that caesar would will to him all his vast estates and other wealth which would have been some slight compensation for the non-restoring of her throne while cleopatra abode in rome more than one man of world fame bowed in homage before her for example lepidus fat stupid inordinately rich fit dupe for cleverer politicians marcus antonius too caesar's protege and at this time a swaggering lovable dissolute soldier demagogue whose fortunes were so undissolubly fastened to caesar's that he the winner of a horde of women dared not lift his eyes to the woman caesar loved among the rest marcus brutus snarling casca and the others came one more guest to the villa a hard-faced cold-eyed youth whom cleopatra hated for he was caius octavius caesar's nephew and presumptive heir the man who was years hence to be the emperor augustus at length one day rome's streets surged with hysterical mobs and factions and news came to the villa that caesar had been assassinated at the forum speedily an angry crowd besieged cleopatra's house now that the all-feared caesar no longer lived to protect her the people were keen to wreak punishment on this foreign sorceress who had enmeshed the murdered man's brain and had made him squander upon her so much of the public wealth that might better have gone into roman pockets rome's new government too at once ordered her expulsion from the city cleopatra avoiding the mob and dodging arrest fled from rome with her son her fortune and her few faithful serfs one more hope was gone for instead of leaving his money to caesarian caesar in his will had made the cold-eyed youth caius octavius his heir back to the east went cleopatra her son of success temporarily in shadow in semi-empty if regal state she queened it for a time her title barren her real power in egypt practically confined to her brain and to her charm nominal queen of egypt she was still merely holding the reins while iron-handed rome strode at the horse's head from afar she heard from time to time the tidings from rome the men who had slain caesar had themselves been overthrown in their place rome and all the world was ruled by a triumvirate made up of three men she well remembered octavius antony and lepidus the next news was that antony and octavius had painlessly extracted lepidus from the combination and were about to divide the government of the whole known world between themselves antony to whom first choice was given selected the eastern half for his share leaving the west to octavius then came word that antony was on his way toward egypt thither bound in order to investigate certain grave charges made by her subjects against cleopatra herself once more were the queen's throne and her life itself in peril and once more she called upon her matchless power over men to meet and overcome the new menace when antony drew near to the capital cleopatra set forth to meet him not with such an army as she might perchance have scraped together to oppose the invader but relying solely on her own charms antony by this time was well past his first youth here is plutarch's word picture of him he was of a noble presence he had a goodly thick beard a broad forehead and a crooked nose 
and there appeared such a manly look in his countenance as is seen in the statues of hercules and it is incredible what marvellous love he won yes and it is incredible into what messes that same marvellous love first and last dragged him he had a wondrous genius for war and for statesmanship but ever just as those qualities lifted him to eminence some woman would drag him down for instance as a young man his budding political hopes were wrecked by flavia a charmer who enslaved him later rome turned a deaf ear to the tales of his military glory because he chose to escort openly along the appian way a frail beauty named cytheria in a chariot drawn by four lions in rapid succession he like his idol caesar married four wives flavia was the first she who blasted his early statesmanship ambitions next antonia from whom he soon separated third fulvia a shrew who made his home life a burden and whose temper drove him far from her not that he really needed such incentive but fulvia loved him as did all women for when cicero lay dead she went to the orator's bier and thrust a bodkin through the once magic tongue thus punishing the tongue she explained for its calumnies against her beloved husband fulvia was not exactly a cosy corner wife as you perhaps have observed yet when she died antony was heartily sorry he said so at the time he was far away from rome and home he had not taken fulvia to egypt with him and was basking in cleopatra's wiles on a visit to rome he next married octavia sister of octavius it was a state match he speedily deserted her and hurried back to egypt antony true lover and false husband hero and fool rake and statesman had fifty sides to his character and a woman was on every side in times of peace he wallowed in the wildest dissipation and spent vast fortunes without a second thought in war he was the idol of his men carousing with them sharing their hard fare and harder life never losing their adoring respect always the hero for whom they would blithely die and so back to the story up the river Sidnus sailed Antony, bent on restoring order to Egypt and punishing the cruel Cleopatra. And down the river Sidnus to meet him came Cleopatra. The barge wherein lay the queen had sails of purple and gold. It was propelled by oars of pure silver. Around the recumbent Cleopatra were beautiful attendants clad or unclad as nymphs graces cupids she herself wore on her left ankle a jewelled band in which was set a sacred scarab that was the full extent of her costume at a single look antony forgot for ever the punitive object of his journey to egypt forgot that he was ruler of half the world and that he had the cleverness and power to oust octavius from the other half and to rule it all he forgot everything except that he loved her and was content to be her helpless and happy slave that she was the supreme love of his thousand loves that the world was well lost for such love as hers from that moment the old-time magnetic statesman and general marcus antonius with his shrewd plans for world conquest was dead in his place lived mark antony prince of lovers a man whose sole thought and aim in life consisted in worshipping at the bare feet 
of a red-haired, snub-nosed Egyptian woman. Caesar had loved Cleopatra and won. Mark Antony loved her and lost. Lost everything except perfect happiness. But for her, Antony might have striven night and day with brain, will, and body, using his friends as sacrifices, employing a statesmanship that was black treachery, drenching all Europe in blood. But for Cleopatra, he might have done all this. He might, as a result, have ousted Octavius and made himself, for the minute, master of all the world, as a price for his years of racking toil, before some patriotic assassin got a chance to kill him. Thanks to Cleopatra's malign influence, the old warrior spent his last years instead in a golden fool's paradise whose joys have become historic. Wherefore, the school books hold up Antony as a horrible example of what a man may throw away through folly. I have tried in the preceding few paragraphs to reinforce the school book's teachings, to show that it is better to toil than to trifle, to sweat and suffer than to saunter through Arcady, to die dead tired than to die divinely happy. I am sure I make the point clear. If I do not, the fault is not mine, and the sad, sad example of Antony has gone for naught. They had a wonderful time there in the lotus land, these two super-lovers. Each had had a host of earlier affairs. But these now served merely as do the many rough detail sketches that work up at last into the perfected picture. It was no heavy tragedy romance. The two mature lovers had a saving sense of fun that sent them on larks worthy of high school revelers. By night, they would go in disguise through the city to revel unrecognized at some peasant wedding or orgy. Once, the incognito Antony on such an expedition got a sound thrashing and a broken head from taking too prominent a part on a slum festivity, and Cleopatra never let him hear the last of it. That the all-conquering Marcus Antonius should have been beaten up by a crowd of Egyptian fellahin, who trembled at the very mention of his name, struck her as the joke of the century. She had a right lively sense of humor, had this serpent of old Nile, as Antony playfully nicknamed her, and probably this sense of humor was one of the strongest fetters that bound to her the love veteran who was sick of a succession of state-lily, humorless Roman beauties. Cleopatra was forever playing practical jokes on her lover. Once, for example, as she and Antony sat fishing off their anchored barge in the Alexandria harbor, Antony wagered that he would make the first catch. Cleopatra took the bet. A moment afterward, Antony felt a mighty tug at his line. With the zest of a born fisherman, he drew in. He brought to the surface, suspended from his hook, an enormous fish, dried, boned, and salted. Cleopatra had privily sent one of her divers over the far side of the barge to swim down and fasten the salted fish to her sweetheart's line. Again the talk ran to the unbelievable cost of some of the feasts, the ancient Persian monarchs had been wont to give, and the wholesale quantity of priceless wines drunk at those banquets, whereat Cleopatra offered to wager that she could drink ten million sesterces, four hundred fifty thousand dollars, worth of wine at a single sitting. Antony loudly assured her that the thing was impossible. Even so redoubtable a tankard man as himself could not hope to drink one hundredth that value of wine in the most protracted debauch. She insisted. The wager was made. Calling for a goblet of slave's wine, a species of vinegar, the queen dropped into it 
the largest pearl of egypt's royal treasury a gem appraised at four hundred and fifty thousand dollars the treasure dissolved under the vinegar's sharp acid and cleopatra to a gasp of horror from the more frugal onlookers drained the goblet such banquets staggered egypt's resources so did other jolly extravagances rumors of antony's strange infatuation reached rome rome was used to antony's love affairs and rome knew cleopatra of old so rome merely grinned and shrugged its shoulders but when the big revenues that antony had promised to wring from the conquered country failed to arrive rome sorely wounded in the pocketbook began to protest antony's friends at home pointed out to him what capital the crafty octavius would try to make of this new-born dissatisfaction against his colleague in a momentary gleam of sanity antony left the weeping cleopatra and hastened back to rome to face his enemies there all too briefly the man's old genius flamed up he appeased the populace won his former ascendancy over the disapproving senate blocked octavius's plot to hurl him from power and sealed his campaign of inspired diplomacy by marrying his rival's sister octavia at a stroke antony had won back all he had lost octavius was checkmated the people were enthusiastic and once more antony had world rulership within his easy reach but in busy iron-hard rome he fell to remembering the lazy sunshine of egypt the primly gentle octavia was hopelessly insipid by contrast with the glowing superwoman memory tugged ever harder and harder even if this story were fiction instead of prosy fact you would foresee just what was bound to happen back to egypt on some flimsy pretext fled antony he turned his back on rome on his wife on octavius on friend on foe on future he was to see none of them again nor was there to be a second outflash of his old genius the rest was cleopatra the reunited lovers flew from bliss to bliss from one mad extravagance to another statecraft regal dignity common sense all went by the board at rome the effect of antony's whirlwind reinstatement campaign gradually wore off revenues did not flow in from egypt but all sorts of wild stories did and the wilder they were the truer they were rome at large did not bother its brutal head over antony's morals but all rome stormed and howled over the fact that the boundlessly rich kingdom of egypt was bringing in practically no more money to the coffers of rome it was as if men who had invested a fortune in a thirty-story office building should find that the superintendent was holding back all the rents and losing tenants every day octavius was quick to take advantage of all this personally he hated antony and he was bitterly resentful of his sister's desertion politically he wanted to be lord of the world as later he was under the title of emperor augustus and poor enfeebled antony alone stood in his way on the plea that a new money-getter was needed for rome in antony's place octavius easily roused public feeling into a clamor that egypt be invaded antony overthrown and cleopatra put to death octavius as master of rome headed the punitive army of invasion again on news of his foe's approach antony's spirit but this time not his genius flickered back to a ghost of its old flame by messenger he sent octavius a very sporting offer namely that 
waste of lives be avoided by octavius and antony meeting in single combat to the death winner take all but octavius was a politician not a d'artagnan which is why he at last became emperor of rome and ruler of the known earth he had not those cold light eyes and thin lips for nothing he was a strategist rather than a gladiator back to the challenger came this terse reply can antony find no readier mode of death than at the sword of octavius on moved the invaders and antony took enough time from cleopatra's side to make half-hearted preparations to resist the first clash of any importance was the sea fight off actium there fortune was inclined for the time to smile once again on her old prime favorite all along the line antony's warships were driving back and breaking the formation of octavius's then at the crucial moment of the fight cleopatra who in a royal galley was watching the conflict ordered her galley put about and headed for the distant shore to this day no one knows whether her fatal order was the result of a whim or of sudden cowardice or of both her galley swept away from the battle antony seeing it depart feared cleopatra might have been wounded by a stray arrow at once he forgot that the issue of the day depended solely on him he realized only that the woman he worshipped might be injured and he ordered his own galley to put off in pursuit of cleopatra's the captains of antony's other ships seeing their leader apparently running away were seized with panic terror and followed the fight became a rout antony's fleet was annihilated with that strangely won battle the last real obstacle between octavius and complete victory was down steadily the conqueror advanced on alexandria cleopatra saw how things were going she knew that antony was forever broken and that as a protector against the oncoming romans he was helpless so she thriftily shifted her allegiance to octavius sending him word that she was his admiring slave and that she craved a personal interview it was the same old siren trick at sight when she was sixteen she had won caesar's heart at sight when she was twenty-eight she had won antony's heart and soul on sight now at thirty-eight she hoped to make of octavius a second antony but caesar had had black eyes and antony's eyes were a soft brown whereas the eyes of octavius were pale gray and fireless had cleopatra bothered to study physiognomy she might have sought some more hopeful plan than to enslave such a man as this new invader octavius cold and heartless as he was would not trust himself to meet the superwoman which was perhaps the highest of the billion tributes that were soon or late paid to cleopatra's charms instead octavius sent her a courteous message assuring her of his respect and infinite admiration and saying that he would see that she was treated with every consideration due her rank to his friends however he loudly boasted that she should walk barefoot through rome bound by gold chains to his chariot axle and word of this boast came to cleopatra the game was up she walled herself into the huge royal mausoleum and had word sent forth that she was dead antony himself in hiding from the advancing romans heard and believed nothing was left 
he had blithely thrown away the world for love and now after ten years of glorious happiness the woman for whom he had been so glad to sacrifice everything was dead his foes were hastening to seize him there was but one course for a true roman in such a plight to follow the example of brutus of cato of a hundred other iron patriots rose before him and their example antony followed he drove his sword through his body and fell dying just as news came to him that cleopatra lived with almost his last breath antony ordered his slaves to carry him to the queen the doors and lower windows of the mausoleum were bricked up there was no time to send for masons to break an opening in them if the dying man would reach cleopatra alive so he was lifted by ropes to an upper window of the tomb and was then swung into the room where cleopatra awaited him and in the arms of the woman who had wrecked him and who at the last though mercifully he never knew it had sought to betray him mark antony died perhaps it was an ignoble death and an anticlimax perhaps it was a fit end for the life of this man who had ever been the adored of women and the death he himself would have chosen fate seldom makes a blunder in setting her scenes so perished mark antony to whose life and death before you judge him i beg you to apply the words of a country preacher i once heard the preacher was discanting on the biblical personage out of whom were cast seven devils brethren said the exhorter a man must be far above the ordinary to contain seven devils in the average man's petty nature there isn't room even for a single half-size devil to say nothing of seven full-grown ones cleopatra had long since made up her mind to die sooner than walk in chains through the streets where once she had swept as caesar's peerless sweetheart but she was part greek and part egyptian both soft nations lacking in the stern qualities of rome she had no taste for naked steel she was content to die but she wanted to die without pain uncertain of her slaves she practised the effects of various oriental poisons some of these slaves died in agony some in mere discomfort one of them died with a smile on his lips a slave on whom had been inflicted the bite of the tiny gray nile mud asp cleopatra's question was answered she put an asp to her breast the serpent fixed its fangs in her white flesh and cleopatra model and synonym for a world full of superwomen was very comfortably spared the shame of walking chained and barefoot in a roman triumph end of chapter 7 recording by linda johnson chapter 8 of superwomen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org superwomen by albert payson terhune chapter 8 george sand the hopelessly ugly siren a very famous woman discovered once that men are not paragons of fidelity or finding that one man was not she decided that all men were alike and to jules sandeau who had deceived her she exclaimed in fine melodrama frenzy my heart is a grave from the number of its occupants drawled sandeau i should rather call it a cemetery 
the woman too angry to grasp the meaning of the ungallant speech raged on but i will be avenged i shall write the tragedy of my love in romance form and why not in city directory form suggested the man and the loverly conversation ended in hysterics the woman was amandine lucille aurore dupin du devant history literature and the annals of superwomen know her as george sand as one may glean from her verbal tilt with sandeau she was not a recluse or a misanthropist in fact she numbered her ardent wooers by the dozen her love life began at a convent school when she was little more than a child and it endured until old age set in perhaps a list of its victims as sandeau so cruelly hinted would have resembled a city directory it certainly would have borne a striking likeness to a cyclopedic index of europe's nineteenth-century celebrities for it embraced such immortal names as de musset sandeau balzac chopin carlyle prosper merime Liszt, dumas and many another so many demigods knelt at her shrine that at last she wrote i am sick of great men i would far rather see them in plutarch than in real life in plutarch or in marble or in bronze their human side would not disgust me so and the personality the appearance the venusberg charm of this heart monopolist one instinctively pictures a svelte form a face that launched a thousand ships and all the rest of the sirenic paraphernalia that instinctively attach themselves to one's mental vision of a wholesale fracturer of hearts here is balzac's description of her it is found in a letter written to madame hanska in eighteen thirty eight when george sand was at the acme of her superwoman career i found her in her dressing-gown smoking an after-dinner cigar beside the fire in an immense room she wore very pretty yellow slippers with fringes coquettish stockings and red trousers physically she has acquired a double chin like a well-fed priest she has not a single white hair in spite of her terrible misfortunes her beautiful eyes are as sparkling as ever when she is sunk in thought she looks just as stupid as formerly as i told her for her expression lies wholly in her eyes she goes to bed at six in the morning and rises at noon i go to bed at six in the evening and rise at midnight but of course i am conforming myself to her habits she smokes to excess and plays perhaps too much the grand dame carlyle still less merciful snarls forth the following wholly carlylean epitome of george sand's looks she has the face of a horse another contemporary writer declares her hair is as black and shiny as ebony her swarthy face is red and heavy her expression fierce and defiant yet dull so much for the verity of traditional siren dreams so much too for the theory that beauty or daintiness or femininity has anything to do with the nameless charm of the world's superwomen george sand came honestly if left-handedly by her cardiac prowess for she was a great great granddaughter of adrienne le couvreur and marshal saxe two of history's stellar heartbreakers a fact of which she made much her father was a french army officer lieutenant dupin and as a mere baby his only daughter aurore was acclaimed daughter of the regiment decked out in a tiny uniform the ugly duckling ran wild in the army posts where her father was stationed and joined right boisterously in the soldiers rough sports later she was sent to a convent from her own description of this particular retreat 
it was a place that crushed out all normal and childish ideas and filled the growing mind with a morbid melancholy yet it was there that love first found the girl the victim or victor was one stephane de grandsain professor of physiology under his tuition she developed a queer craving for dissection a fad she followed in psychic form through life the love scenes between herself and her adored professor were usually enacted while they were together dissecting a leg or an arm or probing the mysteries of retina and cornea it was a semi-gruesome unromantic episode and it ended with suddenness when the pupil was sent out into the world there a husband was found for her he was casimir dudevant a man she liked well enough and who was mildly fond of her they lived together for a time in modified content two children were born to them by and by casimir took to drink many people refused to blame him indeed there are present-day students of george sand's life who can find a host of excuses for his bibulous failings but once coming home from a spree casimir forgot to take his wife's lofty reproaches with his wonted good nature in a flash of drunken anger he struck her and she left him the high spirit of her active independence is marred just a little by the fact that she chanced to be in love with another man this other man was aurelien de Cez, a ponderous country magistrate the affair was brief presently the two had parted and george sand penniless went to paris to make a living by literature she obtained hack work of a sort lived in the typical draughty garret so dear to unrecognized genius and earned for a time only fifteen francs three dollars a month it was the customary nadir wherein one gathers equipment for success then she met jules sandeau he was a lawyer who dabbled in literature he fell in love with the lonely woman and she with him they formed a literary partnership together they wrote novels and began to achieve a certain measure of good luck their novels were signed george sand why no one knows it was a pen name devised by the feminine member of the novelistic firm but before long sandeau was left far behind in the race for fame his more or less fair partner wrote a novel on her own account it was indiana like byron she woke one morning to find herself famous the book had lifted her forever out of obscurity and need at about the same period she entered sandow's study one day just in time to see him kiss another woman the other woman chanced to be their laundress who presumably was more kissable if less inspiring than was the newly acclaimed celebrity on whom sando had been lavishing his fickle affections there was a scene unequalled for violence in any of their joint novels and in the course of it occurred the repartee recorded at the beginning of this story as an upshot sando followed dudevant de Cez, grand seine and the rest into the limbo of george sand's discarded lovers where he was soon to be joined by many another and far greater man her faith in men shattered for at least the fourth time george sand forswore fidelity and resolved to make others suffer even as she liked to imagine she herself had suffered the literary world was by this time cheering itself hoarse over her and literary giants were vying for her love out of the swarm she selected prosper merimee the author of carmen was then in his prime as a lion of the salons to him george sand gave her heart irrevocably and forever through youth and maturity they worshipped each other for eight consecutive days on the ninth day george sand informed carmen's creator 
that he was far too cynical to be her ideal any longer mary me retorted that her pose of divine exaltation was better suited to an angel than to an ugly woman who continually smoked cigars and who swore as pyrotechnically as one of her father's most loquacious troopers so the romance ended followed a bevy of loves well nigh as brief most of whose heroes names are emblazoned on the book backs of the world's libraries and after this populous interregnum came alfred de musset de musset was a mere boy but his wonderful poetry had already awakened europe to ecstasy he was the beau ideal of a million youthful lovers and their sweethearts even as a generation earlier byron had been it was in eighteen thirty three that he and george sand met de musset had seen her from afar and had begged for an introduction she was six years older than he and the prettiest girls in france were pleading wistfully for his smile but at sight he loved the horse-faced almost middle-aged swearer of strange oaths and smoker of strong cigars hence his plea to be introduced saint beuve to whom he made the request wrote asking leave to bring him to one of george sand's at homes the same day she returned a most positive refusal writing i do not want you to introduce de musset to me he is a fop and we would not suit each other instead bring dumas in whose art i have found a soul if only the soul of a commercial traveller but de musset unrebuffed succeeded in his ambition he managed to secure an introduction to her at a banquet given by the revue des deux mondes editors and almost at once his love was reciprocated then began a union that was alternately the interest the scandal and the laughing stock of a continent each of the lovers was a genius each had been pedestalled by the world each was supposed to live on a rarefied plain far above the heads or the ken of mere earth folk the love affair of two such immortals might reasonably be expected was expected to be akin to the noble romances of poetry as a matter of fact its three-year course was one long series of babyish spats of ridiculous scenes and of behavior worthier the inmates of a madhouse or a kindergarten than of the decade's two master intellects george sand expected de musset to live on the heights of bloodless idealism when he did so she berated him as heartless when he failed to she denounced him as an animal she was never content with whatever course he might follow yet she was madly in love with him during their brief separations she avalanched him with letters some furious some imploring some wildly affectionate some drearily commonplace here is an extract from one displaying a fair sample of her warmer moods it is nothing to you to have tamed the pride of such a woman as i and to have stretched me a suppliant at your feet it is nothing to you that i am dying of love torment of my life that you are in the course of the cranky affair they journeyed to italy there in turn both fell ill and there through the medium of the sick-room both met a handsome young italian doctor pietro pagello who by the way was still living a very few years ago at the age of ninety pagello's dark good looks and his vivacity temporarily swept george sand's heart far out of poor convalescent de musset's reach she became blindly infatuated with the young doctor de musset jealously sick and sickly jealous was quick to see how matters stood and with true gallic sensationalism he rose to the dramatic occasion first he swore eternal brotherhood and loyalty to the doctor whom he scarcely knew and then 
joining the embarrassed pagello's hand to george sand's the poet tearfully declaimed i know all you love each other take him aurore as the parting gift of a lover you have ceased to love take her pietro as a memento of your sworn friend adieu both of you for ever de musset strode from the room in a style that would have evoked an applause storm from even a deaf and dumb gallery he left italy and came back to france there he loudly bewailed his fate and moaned rhythmically anent the false flame of woman's love meanwhile george sand found to her surprise that she loved the dramatic de musset far more than she loved pagello she followed de musset to paris bringing pagello along for good measure when she had gone to italy with de musset paris had gasped even the usual latitude allowed to geniuses had been perilously stretched when de musset had returned orpheus like weeping all over the strings of his lyre paris had wept with him but now that the heroine of the escapade followed in full chase of the discarded one dragging his successor in her wake paris howled with inextinguishable laughter de musset poetically sensitive to every change of opinion refused to make himself ridiculous while renewing his vow of brotherly friendship for pagello he utterly refused to see george sand or to answer one of her thousand beseeching letters pagello too began to feel supremely uncomfortable in his thankless role of excess baggage he squirmed nervously in search of a door of escape he quickly found one monsieur de musset must hate me for what i have done he announced to all who would stop laughing long enough to listen to him he has probably sworn a blood feud against me i will not remain here to become the victim of a vendetta and he fled incontinently to his native italy leaving george sand alone to face the now redoubled spasms of public mirth tragically humorless deaf to snicker and guffaw she set herself to the tedious task of winning back de musset when letters were of no avail she sought to waylay him in the street or elsewhere forewarned he kept to his rooms then she stationed herself on his doorstep and wept there like a modern and uglier niobe for all to see de musset kept still closer hidden from view in desperation the unhappy woman resolved to follow the historic example of ninon de l'enclos in reclaiming an errant lover she cut off her heavy black hair her one beauty and sent it by messenger to the coy de musset the sacrifice was vain perhaps the beauty-loving poet remembering how homely she had looked even with her luxuriant hair drew a vivid mind picture of what she must look like without it at all events he made no sign of forgiveness one day de musset coming unguardedly out of his apartment collided on the stairs with the weeping woman there was a partial and very temporary reconciliation followed soon by a permanent break george sand tingling with hurt pride proceeded to write a novel wherein under a painfully thin and open-work veil she told the story of her love affair with de musset it is waste of space to add that she told it from her own angle depicting herself as a gentle too loving martyr and painting de musset as a false affected ludicrously worthless personage the novel set paris to jabbering as noisily as it had just laughed de musset was regarded as a monster a monument of duplicity and his former sweetheart as a patient saint but the poet was not long in preparing a counterblast promptly he threw into the arena a book in which under still thinner disguise he gave his own version of the story 
In this volume, de Musset was a trusting lover and George Sand a viper. There were further recriminations in print and out of it. Literary Paris was divided into two camps. Between the pro Mussets and the pro Sands, the war raged merrily. Swinburne crystallized the case in a deathless epigram. De Musset was wrong, but George did not behave as a gentleman should. For a time, George Sand turned to her work for oblivion. She wrote eight hours a day. Her novels were among the foremost of the century. She was France's best-known woman. The men who had loved her served now as characters for her books, as had de Musset. Mercilessly she dissected them, memories of the physiology professor, and held up to scorn their faults, their frailties, their crass humanness. There was gnashing of teeth. There was recognition wholesale there was protest there were legions of threats to prosecute said merry old abby list himself a heart conqueror of renown each of your admirers madame is a butterfly which you lure to you by honey impale upon the pin of jealousy or boredom and finally vivisect in a novel after a mere breathing space came what was probably the grand passion of george sand's ultra-passionate life a romance with none of the ironic humour that lighted her affair with de musset the hero victim what you will was frederick chopin too fiery soul in too fragile body genius wonder musician dreamer the man had always been tossed on misfortune's waters, hammered by them till his mighty soul had well nigh torn free from the failing flesh. And at this period, of all others, fate threw him into the life of George Sand. He was slender, weak, almost effeminate in his unfleshliness. She was brutally robust, mannish aggressive his exact opposite and they loved loved more deeply more all-absorbingly than either had loved before in a mutually long era of heart destroying in fact george sand loved chopin as she loved nothing else on earth with the sole exception of her idolized self the hand of death was already on chopin when he and george sand met this super vital woman seemed to breathe into him some of her own tireless vitality his health rallied it was said by fanciful acquaintances that george sand's life was keeping life in her lover she heard and was glad and hastened to proclaim the wonder to her friends adding thereby a leaf to her martyr crown by sheer will-power and excess vital force she actually buoyed up her frail lover's sinking strength and gave him a new lease of living this did not prevent her from quarrelling fiercely and frequently with him as she always did with every man or woman who came into personal acquaintance with her chopin begged her to marry him she refused one venture in matrimony had sufficed her not even to make happy the man she loved would she essay a second trial of wedlock in her first onrush of devotion for chopin she could not blind herself to the fact that even as she had tired of others so she might one day tire of him and divorces in france were not easy to get hence the dying chopin's supreme wish went ungratified as had many a lesser wish during his affair with her the sick composer had known many loves yet from the hour he met george sand he seems to have been steadfast to that single devotion it is not on record that he so much as aroused her ever wakeful jealousy and he is probably the only man of her love-starred career who did not which is odd 
in view of this assertion by one of Chopin's biographers. He found himself unable to avoid accepting some of the numberless hearts that were flung like roses at his feet. He could modulate from one love affair to another, as fleetly and as gracefully as from one key to its remote neighbor. Here, too, is the account given by a later chronicler of the composer's meeting with George Sand. One evening, as he was entering a house where a literary reception was in progress, Chopin fancied he was pursued by a violet-scented phantom. In superstitious fear, he would have left the house at once, but friends who were with him laughed away his dread and described the phenomenon as the fancy of a sick man's brain. He entered the crowded salon and was forthwith presented to the guest of honor a swarthy and strange-looking woman, the premier novelist, Madame du Devant, George Sand. In his diary that same night, Chopin wrote of his new acquaintance, I do not like her face. There is something in it that repels me. Yet within a day or so, he was her adorer. For a time, all went as well as any love story could, with such a heroine, she gloried in her power to build up for the moment her lover's waning strength. Her friend's praise of the feat was as music to her. But she was not the type of woman who can forever wait patiently upon a fretful, convalescent whims. Her self-sacrifice was a flash, not a steady flame. And in time, she girded at the restraints of playing nurse and vitality giver. Then, instead of boasting as before she waxed complaining. She told the world at large how exacting and cross and tiresome Chopin was. She once referred to him publicly as that detestable invalid. She announced that she was his ever-patient comrade and nurse. There is no authority but hers to bear out the claim of patience. And so the once beautiful relationship dragged out its weary length until George Sand could endure the strain no longer. She deserted Chopin. Not content with this final blow to the invalid, who had loved her for years, she continued to vilify him. Among her complaints was one that has since passed in slightly altered form into a good old reliable vaudeville wheeze. She wrote, we never addressed a single reproach to each other except once, and that was from the first to the last time we met. George Sand's desertion was Chopin's death blow. He never rallied from it. He tried to mask his heartbreak by going about as before and appearing often in public, but even this was soon denied to him, not only by collapsed health, but from the danger of meeting his former divinity at the houses he chanced to visit or on the streets. One such lesson was enough for him. It was in a friend's crowded drawing-room. A historian describes the encounter. Thinking herself unobserved, George Sand walked up to Chopin and held out her hand. Frederick, she murmured, in a voice audible to him alone, he saw her familiar form standing before him. She was repentant, subdued, and seeking reconciliation. His handsome face grew deadly pale, and without a word, he left the room. The end came soon afterward. Chopin's mortal illness struck him down. Dying, he sent for his lost love. Perhaps the message never reached her. Perhaps she thought it a trick. She had tried something of the sort on de Musset. Perhaps she did not realize that the time was so short. At all events, she paid no heed to the frantic appeal that she come at once to the dying composer. Hour after hour, Chopin waited for her, his ears strained for the sound of her heavy tread. At last, he grew to realize that she would not obey the summons that he would never again see her. As hope fled, Chopin broke down and cried piteously. 
she promised i should die in no arms but hers he sobbed over and over and that night he died no less than seven different women claiming later to have taken his recreant sweetheart's place at his deathbed george sand was conscience-stricken she wrote and proclaimed long and more or less plausible reasons to account for her failure to go to chopin but no one who really knew her was convinced of her excuses truth and so ended one more of her heart stories de musset by the way refused to admit her to his rooms when he himself lay dying a grisly joke that paris appreciated back to her work as once before george sand fled for forgetfulness and her fame grew she was the most prolific woman writer by the way in literature's history writing in all twenty plays and more than one hundred novels an englishman name buried courted her at about this time still miserable over chopin's death and far more so over the way people were talking about her treatment of him she was decidedly waspish to the trans channel admirer seeking to win her interest in a literary discussion he opened one conversation by inquiring madame de devant what is your favorite novel olympia she answered without a second of hesitance olympia the englishman repeated vainly ransacking his memory i don't think i recall any book of that name of course you don't she snapped i haven't written it yet and perhaps or perhaps not his british brain some day unraveled the meaning of cryptic retort for her infidelities george sand felt no compunction she wrote frankly concerning them i have never imposed constancy upon myself when i have felt that love is dead i have said so without shame or remorse and have obeyed providence that was leading me elsewhere by her marriage with dudevant she had had a son and a daughter the daughter solange inherited much of her mother's lawlessness with none of the latter's inspiration and now george sand was to see how her own nature worked in another of the same blood she arranged a splendid marriage for solange a marriage with a man of rank and money and on the very eve of the wedding solange proceeded to elope with a poor sculptor clesinger by name the mother was equal to the emergency she ran after the fugitives caught them bullied clesinger into marrying solange hushed all scandal and installed the young couple in a paris flat settling on them the bulk of her property in revenge clesinger permanently estranged solange from her mother soon afterward george sand's sway over men's hearts ceased whether she was weary of love or whether love was weary of her the old fascination deserted her no more as lovers but as profound admirers of her intellect great men still flocked about her matthew arnold flaubert fouillet and a host of others but it was now her brain alone they worshipped by many years george sand outlived her charm dying in eighteen seventy six at the age of seventy two her grandchildren about her a smugly proper if sadly anticlimacteric ending to a career in which anticlimax had been almost as infrequent as propriety end of chapter eight recording by linda johnson